I had not planned, but I think not a conscious plan of my own life, but somewhere deep inside, what was happening in my life was planning for itself. So in 2002, uh, in a beautiful, pleasant afternoon in London, we were sitting in a park and we were supposed to have a workshop on Freire's pedagogy, on empowering through literacy. And suddenly the facilitator hands us chart papers with color pens and pencils saying, I want you all to draw the river of your life. And I was like, river of my life? There are certain things that always remains within us and not to be shared. And till that day, I didn't want to think the river of my life, how it started and where I was. Well, five decades and more, in a wintry night, an elderly grand uncle of mine heard a knock at his door. He opens the door and says he saw Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth. She came and said that my parents are going to have a daughter. And lo and behold, I was born the same early morning at four. And my parents named me Dharitri, a name that came from Sri Aurobindo Ashram Pondicherry. The name signifies forbearance, patience, and serenity. And of course, I'm none of those, <laughs> especially patience. And that was more than five decades ago. And I grew up in a joint family with uncles, aunts, cousins, brothers, and sisters. And most of the time not knowing who my real parents were because there were too many mummies and papas and daddies and bapas and bows in my family. My early childhood was not that pleasant and I don't wish to speak about it uh, here. But when I was in my adolescent years, at the age of 14, my aunt committed suicide. And I, wanted, I was not with my parents and I was in a different city studying and living with my uncle and aunt and I wanted to come back and live with my parents. And within a few months, my dad, at a very young age of 44, passed away. He was a politician, he was an industrialist, he was a media baron, he was an educationist, he was everything. And he had huge dreams. He wanted to be a change maker. I remember once coming and asking him, what do you do? My friends ask me, everyone's Father is a doctor, engineer, teacher, lecturer. What are you? I don't want to say my father is a politician. I'm ashamed. And he very, very, very sweetly patted me and said, you can say your father is a social worker. My dad was my role model. I wanted to fulfill his unfulfilled dreams that like most of us would always look up to our parents and see that we become like them. My mother had got married at the age of 16, widowed at the age of 32, not having had a formal, proper education. And as it happens, everything was taken away. She lost all her properties and assets, and it was very difficult for us to grow up. But I'd never seen her shed a tear. She was also my role model. My role model in a different way. I didn't want to be her. I always rebelled and say, Ma, I don't want to be like you. I don't want to marry early. I want to be educated. I want to get the, I want to go to the best university in the world. And I do want to have a voice. I don't want to be voiceless like you. But she was the one who was my inspiration because she inspired me to be what I am today. She inspired me to do what I want to do today. And then, I also realized, while I was doing my river of life, do I have friends? I still get to hear. I have very less friends since childhood. And why is that? Because I always thought I'm different, I'm unique. My experiences were different and unique. While the outside world thought I was a pampered child, no one knew what I was going through. Most of us are misunderstood because what we portray to the outside world is not who we really are. And that's also something I realized when I was drawing the river of my life. And these episodes in my life or experiences in my life 
were my first rocks and boulders that my river faced. But not to be undeterred, a river doesn't stop flowing, it keeps flowing. And I remember when I was doing my undergrad in a government college in Bhubaneswar, BJB College, I kept reading about all these Harvard professors uh, in my psychology books. So I went and told my mother, I want to go to Harvard. She was like, Harvard, what's that? I said, okay, let me find out how much it costs. And we had a landline. And mind you, we did not have internet connections. This is early 1990s. And I kept making calls to Harvard University. And would you believe, I made a bill of 99,000 rupees, ISD bills, which of course my mother couldn't pay and the landline got disconnected. So I walked up to my mother and said, I want to go to Harvard. Can you please give me 26 lakhs of rupees? She was like, what? 26 lakhs of rupees, do you know how much it is? I said, yeah, it's a big, a huge quantity, uh, but uh, won't you be um, uh, able to give it to me? She looked at me and she saw the determination in my eyes that I really wanted to go to Harvard. So she got me her jewelry box and said, this I've kept for your wedding. You can use it for your education. I looked at my mother's face and said, oh, she's very innocent. And that's again something I would prefer not to be. And said, mama, this is not going to take me to Harvard. But one day I will go to Harvard. You can keep this and maybe I won't use this for my wedding also. And so I buried my whole dream of going to Harvard. And I said, it's not possible. How am I ever going to have lakhs of rupees to go to Harvard? So forget it. When I was in fourth grade, I read about Mother Teresa in my history book. And since then, I've always wanted to be like her. And someone told me I can become a professional social worker if I go and study in Tata Institute of Social Sciences. I said, okay, that's more doable. I'm studying with a free scholarship in the government college. And TISS would also offer me scholarship. So that's something my mother can afford the mess fees. So let me go there. And so at that time, uh, TIS had one campus and huge competition. And there was no email to uh, send us the offer letter. I remember waiting for TIS's offer. And since it didn't come, I decided to go to JNU where I had already got my admission. The day I was uh, going to take my train to Delhi, the telegram comes. I don't know how many of you now ever see a postman coming and delivering a telegram. And it says, you've got admission in to secure your seat immediately in criminology. Criminology, you would wonder why? That's not social work. Well, just that day, a year, I had lost my maternal uncle who was very dear to me. He was shot dead by insurgents in Nagaland. And I wanted to understand the psyche of those people who kill others. Senseless killings, what does it mean? Why do people do it? And how do you reform them? And that made me apply for a master's degree in criminology and correctional administration. I worked with under trials uh, in Mumbai. The first day I was sent for, a, for an exposure visit to a reception center. That's where uh, women who are trafficked and rescued are sent to. A woman comes running towards me, holds me and starts crying says, I want to be out of this place. I have young children, and I was all of 20 years. As such, I'd left my home, my mother, and that whole sheltered life of Bhubaneswar, a small town girl. And I'm here in this huge city, Mumbai, where I have to take local trains, buses, and visit centers like this. And this woman crying, how can I help her? And she narrated her story of rape, abuse, and how she was trafficked by her own husband. And that made me realize I'm not unique. My story is not unique of abuse and trauma. There are many in this world who have gone through it. And that made me also firm of my conviction that yes, I want to do something that transforms others' lives, especially that of children and women. And that started my journey into the world of nonprofit, working 
uh, after the aftermath of the Orissa cyclone in 99, to working with tribals and child rights, both in Orissa, nationally and globally. I moved to London to work as the head of knowledge man management of an international organization, and that's where what I started with was where I was doing the river of my life. And while drawing my river of my life in 2002, I realized Harvard was my dream. Why did I give it up? I pursued everything. I worked on rights of women and children. I wanted to travel the world. I did that. I wanted to make my mother happy, make her proud of me. I did that. But why did I give up Harvard? And that's when I, again, started applying to all the colleges, the Ivy Leagues in the US. And with God's grace, I got into it. I got into Harvard as a Mason Fellow. Cult it, Harvard was not a culture shock for me, not like what Mumbai was. And then the river of my life seemed to be quite smooth, you know, after a long, long time. The river was not facing hurdles, and I met my very, very supportive husband and got married. Parthiv was also here in the audience. And I thought, okay, this is what me it means to be normal, to have a family, to have a supportive husband who supports you in whatever you do, who puts you before him, and, and we, uh, we had our first child in the US. And then my restlessness, my impatience began, because a river doesn't flow in one direction always. I was like, I don't, I'm not made to have a suburban US life. I'm not made for this. Why am I not feeling good? So I said, okay, let me take down a piece of paper and start drawing the river of my life. Where do I want to be in the next 10 years? And I told him, we have to move back. You have a week's time, wind up. He says, where? To, the, to India, we have to go back. And he was like, as whatever you wish to do. So we moved back to India almost 14, 15 years ago. But, and, and we decided we will not, he will not do a job, I'll do a job, but we will start our own company. He was, he's an engineer and he always wanted to build things. And I said, I don't understand technical stuff, but all I can do is like, you've supported my decision to move back. I'll support you in whatever ways at the back end. So I withdrew all my pension funds, all my savings, and we started our company. To be an entrepreneur is not rosy. You see very successful business men and women, people who have inherited things, but for someone who's, for, for a couple who've moved back after years, things have changed in India, and we have no idea how to start, and we started. We started in the field of renewable energy while I was still doing my job and supporting him at the back end. And then uh, we moved to infrastructure. He, being a very hardworking person, moved and you know kept on rising, worked hard. We had more kids, so I became a mother of three children, and that's too normal. I was like, this is, this is smooth. Isn't it? My river of life getting again very, very smooth. And I was restless at the age of 44, who decides to give up a very cushy, enviable job and want to become an entrepreneur? That was me. I was like, I cannot be this. What is it that I want to be? And again, I took a piece of paper and did the river of my life. I also gave up my job in the nonprofit because I did not want to earn from the donations that people were giving that should reach peop the people who are living in poverty and who are marginalized. So I started my nonprofit, which was very, very different, which is very, very different. Out of the five trustees, three of our trustees are from the slums. They are our former child leaders. So the primary stakeholders have more control and decision making on how the organization would run. So I was giving strategic directions and I was again restless. I wanted to do something. So I told my husband, I want to do something completely different. Shall I open up a garage and become a mechanic? He was like, please not again. You know? And he was like, why don't you come and join the company? Join the infra company. I'm 
like, I'm not an engineer. I said, it's OK. That is when, so I was talking about unlearn. You start unlearning all that you have ever learned in your life. Here I was in an infrastructure company, the odd woman out. I remember in one of the meetings, I was told, ma'am, you won't understand. It's very technical. You are not an engineer. And I had to stamp on my ego and say, OK, I'm not an engineer, but this is not rocket science. And so then that day I decided, what is it that I can bring to the organization, to the company? I can't become, I can't fit into the organization because I'm not an engineer. And then that's when I decided to start my nonprofit, Jivada. Because years ago in Northern Cambodia, where I, have a, I stayed in a wellness resort and met this woman who had traveled the world and she said, this is how I realized my dream. And I realized, yes, I want to get into wellness because psychosocial counseling has been part of my work. Working with people with mental health issues, working with people in a, who are in traumatic situations, and something I wanted to do was to align my body, soul, and mind. So that's how my whole idea of having a wellness resort came into being. So. I would like to end my talk today by asking each of you, by urging each of you, by requesting each of you, after this is over, please go back home, take a piece of paper and draw the river of your life. And as Sri Aurobindo has said, the present is the most important moment of your life. So seize the moment and have a beautiful journey ahead. Thank you.